you have the opportunity to impact your client's life in all aspects. The updated weight loss specialization will help trainers in many ways expand their career. For the first time, we talk about the psychosocial aspects, the sociocultural. You're going to be able to truly understand what your clients are going through when they have a specific weight loss journey. All new information, new trends. We were able to develop what we called personas. To provide examples of what you might experience as a fitness professional when you encounter a client. And build confidence as the months go by. I'll feel more comfortable in my skin. My self-confidence will improve. Empathy is something that runs through the weight loss specialization. It's about guiding people. Regarding nutrition, regarding exercise. I can go to bed at night knowing that I've done something good for the world. It's great content and a blueprint for how to get results with your clients. We put together a complete solution to help you, the professional, become the next weight loss specialist. I'm Brad Dieter. Ken Miller. Casey DeYoung. Wendy Batts. Nolan Highland. Mike Fanagrassi. Welcome the NASM's Weight Loss Specialization course. Hello, everybody. This is Marty Miller, and welcome to this week's Master Instructor Roundtable. And as always, I'm here with my great friend, Wendy Batts. Hey, Marty. How are you? I'm great. How's the new year kicking off for you? So far, so good. So no complaints. <laughs> exactly, right? Awesome, awesome. Well, it's always good to jump back in here and pick another topic. And I know that we've laid out the next couple weeks. But as we looked at the schedule, you know, we talked about setting goals. We talked about, you know, looking at everything from a business standpoint, evaluating ourselves and setting the table. So that way we have a successful 2021 and beyond. But we thought before we got into a very specific topic, which maybe we'll talk about towards the end of this one, where we're going, is we just want to kind of get back to the basics. And, you know, Wendy, you and I have been teaching this for well over 15 years, working with it for even longer. And no matter how many times we've looked at what we do in our career and how many different type of people we work with, we're always following the model. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I know, you know, people often, including myself, will start to think, okay, this is going to be way too basic for our client. And we kind of look at it on our end, like, because it might be easy for us, we really sometimes forget to put ourselves in our client's shoes. So I was excited that we were kind of stepping back a little bit and saying that, you know, some of these exercises when done, as we've talked about for many, many weeks with the correct acute, you know, acute variables to so the right intensity, the right tempo and the right form can be very, very challenging. Um, you know, I think personally, this just hap actually happened to a, a trainer that works in, in our facility and we kind of share a client. I do a lot of the manual therapy and she actually does a lot of his training. And I kept noticing that he kept coming in with these like injuries that were repetitive. And so we kind of stepped back and had a conversation and it was like, you know, what are we doing in the programming that is, uh, you know, continuously causing these issues? Because when he gets off the table, he feels great, but then he'll go for a run and he'll like re-injure his calf. And that's one of his main complaints. And so when we looked at the programming, there was a lot of basic balance stuff that was taken out of his program because he's been with her for multiple weeks now. And we actually took him back down to the basics those exercises, such as like a single leg balance with reach, were so challenging for him because he had started to lose some of the stability in his ankle complex that's so important for the things that he enjoys. And so I think we're back on the right track. But having to have that little heart to heart with the trainer of like, let's reevaluate what's happening and what's going, you know, where where are we going wrong? I think it was a good it was a good talk for the trainer and myself and the client all together to really put the pieces you know, back together. That's why I think this week is so important because often we really do feel that it's got to be the most innovative exercise with the most creative modality that they can stand on or something. And, and that's not always the case because if anything, it could be detrimental versus helpful. And, um, and that's just, I, I think something that literally happened on Monday. What's interesting today, I, I go to a gym and I'm kind of undercover there. And I, I like that. <laughs> Because well, and the reason I say that is I want to if that's me time, like I want to go in and I want to work my sets, my reps, my tempos, my rest intervals. I don't I'm not there to, to socialize. Happy to do that afterwards or before. But there's a couple people that I've befriended and they found out 
you know, because of watching some of the unique things I would do, what my background is. So now I kind of feel obligated when I see this one gentleman, such a nice guy exercising, I feel like, okay, I'm going to go up and give him a tip. And he was doing hinging patterns. And of course, what did he do? He would always look up and, you know, I know he was having a shoulder injury and all I did was correct and teach him that, you know, his cervical spine is part of his core. And he struggled doing a hinge, of course, with keeping his head in the right position. And his first, you know, I had him take less weight. I had him do all that. And the first thing he said to me was, that's so much harder. Now, when he meant hard, he didn't mean that, you know, because I didn't add weight. He meant harder to maintain perfect form, but he understood it. And then, Wendy, the other story that I always think about when we look at this is, you know, our mentor taught us, you know, go through the process. And we know the story that he did a movement assessment on somebody that was at a high level in the NBA. They scored very low. He did the work that you're talking about, got off the table. Their movement score efficiency went up dramatically. That athlete goes in and does his strength and conditioning program, comes back on the table and actually moved worse than before he walked in the door. Like, so it's mind blowing that you could actually move worse after strength and conditioning program. So that's why we want to cover this topic today, setting the stage for what's to come with our future instruct master instructor roundtables. Absolutely. And it brings into the very first method that we mentioned, which is, and I'm going to call it, keep it simple, silly. Um, yeah. Because once again, if we, if we continue to try to progress a client too quickly, and that is no matter what through the phases or through the exercise selection, it is not going to be helpful. And, uh, and I will say this probably multiple times throughout this webinar, it's very important to realize that we are not our client. And even taking myself back to the basics, which is what I did at the beginning of the year, I wanted, you know, I've gone through the model, I've done undulated programs, I've gone to, you know, phase five and then phase quote six, if we're thinking about, about it on a powerful level, and I'm not there anymore. I have taken multiple weeks off. I've, you know, got a lot of things going on and going back to the basics, really focusing on my form, drawing in, squeezing glutes, proper alignment with my foot. Um, it was, it was very challenging. And so we don't have to take it so far advanced from day one, because when you're able as a trainer to dial in an exercise and demonstrate it correctly, then that's really helpful for the client to see the proper way. Mm -hmm. But if you yourself are struggling as a, as a trainer demoing the exercise, and then you're asking your client to do a four to one tempo for 12 to 20 reps without compensations, then you need to take a step back and look at yourself. And so we talked about doing self-evaluation um, and, and really diving deep into ourselves. And I think, I think I wanted just to mention that too, you need to be able to do at least two or three perfect, perfect, um, you know, repetitions and then hand it off. But if you are struggling yourself, you know, think about how difficult it'll be for a client who is coming to see you for an hour and who knows what they're doing for the other 23 hours in their day. Yeah. And when we look at the, the KISS, method, KISS method and we have that image there back to basics, please don't think that back to basics means back to beginner, mm -hmm. right? Because people, as they undulate through the program, we've both seen elite athletes do a phase one or even a corrective program that would be far more advanced from a stress level for a beginner. So, you know, when we go back to basics, we're talking about why we took this education, why we wanted to learn how to master this education, go back to fundamental movement patterns and execute them with precision. Does not mean beginner training mean that you're, you're deconditioned. It just means going back to the fundamentals that you learned from a trainer and or in your movement as you're learning this from an exercise standpoint, but it can still be very challenging, just a different type of challenge than what you'd see in the other phases. So please just, I, I want to reiterate back to the basics. We're not trying to say go back to a beginner level. We're going back to the foundation and then target it appropriately for that person's conditioning and their current, you know, control of those movement patterns. Great point. And you're going to see as NASM, you know, goes through and, and talks about their, the, I don't want to call it the new CPT because it's really not new, but when we really look at some of the fundamentals in the, in the book and we look about it, your point, Marty, movement patterns are everything. If you can execute 
like you said, the hinge pattern and you can execute a proper squat or a proper, you know, anything in the shoulder area or within the neck. It's super, super critical because once you have one compensation somewhere throughout the kinetic chain, it can affect everything else. Mm -hmm. And so we often talk, I shouldn't say often, we constantly talk about the importance of the five kinetic chain checkpoints. And if you look on the, on the PowerPoint, you're going to see, we talk next really about progressions and regressions of exercises. And again, to your point, if we have a bridge and somebody can easily execute a bridge on the floor and they really do target and feel it in their glutes and not necessarily their hamstrings or other muscles that we know often take over when a muscle is weak. So we definitely want to keep, um, keep the right muscles firing at the right time, we can progress that to a ball or even adding weight on the hip and then doing hip thrusters. It's really about can they can they do and execute the movement properly and then are they feeling it and is it activating the right muscles that come to our next point uh, that we found out maybe weak based on the assessments. Mm -hmm. And I know we say the assessments are the blueprint, but they truly are. That really should dictate what is how the the program should be written for that individual and every individual is different and so what marty what you may be able to execute at the gym i may be able to execute easily <laughs> mm -hmm. or vice versa sure. and so then we can progress it but if i'm trying to do something that you're doing and it's something that you do constantly and your body really understands it and you have proper you know coordination and movement throughout that entire exercise and i don't i'm teaching my my brain bad information in which is going to lead to bad information out and that's harder to change because we've said this thinking about our brain as a computer we're trying to input really good data into our brain so therefore we're able to produce the right movement but if we start to you know put in some bad information we all know same thing with computers then you get viruses and bugs and things break and and things happen it's the same thing that happens with your body and it's important to know with an exercise, how can you make it harder? And then on the fly, how to make it easier without saying, oh, you didn't do that well, you know, because again, the way as a trainer to build rapport is always try to keep it positive. But it's like, you know what, next time we do that, let's go ahead and just try it on the floor. Let's take that weight off and see if we can get better range of motion. So how you distribute and discuss that with your client is also very important. Yeah, and you know, I try to work in the, in the area of gray sometimes when I can, because you know, there's always the unique situations, but when I look at movement patterns, it's pretty much black or white. Every rep is either moving me towards mastering that movement pattern correctly, or the rep that I'm allowing with any compensation is allowing me to become better at improper form, which is going to take me even further away from having better movement patterns. Now, of course, there could be other muscles involved and other work, right? That's why we have a model. But the, the basic premise is once we start the exercising resistance training, whatever phase, either you're moving one step closer to improving human movement, or you're actually moving a step away from improving human movement. Let's not count about the calories we burn and our, what our mirror looks like, because a horribly designed program can still make you look fit. We're talking about the quality of movement. Yes. And that brings us to the next point of let's discuss and, and we call them. I, I always say these are Marty's three basic rules, but there really are basic rules in you can call in, me in personal, oh, okay. you know, in personal training, as well as in the in the in the fitness profession or even medical profession when you think about the first one. And so if we go to the next slide, the first one, Marty, I'll let you kind of talk about. But it's just super important is really to do yeah. no harm. Yeah. And, the, you know, the crazy thing is I started out as an athletic trainer. So healthcare practitioner, I go through college, I get accepted in the program, I graduate, I pass my national exam, I'm so excited. And the first thing, and I remember this is like four and a half years of school, and the first thing they teach me is just don't screw anybody up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I mean, that's exactly what they teach us. It's like, okay, welcome. Now just don't hurt anybody. Like they're, they're, they didn't say anything about, okay, you need to go and change the world and fix people. Because they know, inevitably, if you take the responsibility of any type of you know, person's body, whether it's nutrition, whether it's orthopedics, whatever that is, there is a chance you could do something that could make things worse. So we have to start that even in fitness. So yes, these are things that, you know, came from my original background, but kind of makes sense to me is, okay, if I'm going to prescribe exercise, and there is a class that we take in college called exercise prescription, there's a reason they call it exercise prescription, because a prescription can have one of three effects. 
a positive, a negative, or a null effect. So we're shooting for two of those three at least, right? The positive <laughs> and the null. But there are chances that if you give an exercise and or then you add in even bad form and technique, there could be consequences. So step one, let's just make sure that we're moving towards improving people and we're not actually feeding into worsening compensations or creating new compensations, actually. And I don't think that any of this should be surprising to our listeners mm -hmm. because with the assessment being your blueprint, if you notice that someone has a, a very noticeable compensation. So let's say that their feet turn out and their knees come in and then you're programming day one that somebody does a jump squat with a stabilization hold. That is a proper phase one exercise that you would do to try to work on landing mechanics. However, if someone you're just now teaching them to foam roll and you're trying to get better length um, within the, the lateral portion of the calf and you're also working on the adductors that are overactive that are really kind of feeding into the knees coming in as well and you know that some of the things that you need to strengthen would be the glutes the outer hip as well as the medial calf if you do some activation exercises and that doesn't clean up and then you have them do a plyometric exercise even with the hold they're not ready for that. And then you could actually be increasing harm by feeding into a compensation and causing, you know, medial pain to the knee. So you'll see the picture on the bottom. This guy, I don't know what he's trying to do. I don't know if he's just trying to lift it up with his arms. I don't know if he's trying to hold it. I don't know if he's trying to perform a squat, but you could see looking at his positioning, how much stress is going just even on the medial portion of his knee, it's not safe. And so just because this looks like, oh, okay, this is great. He's able to pick it up. What is the purpose? So when we say do no harm, make sure that you're really analyzing, as we said earlier, the movement patterns, but then also what is the, what are you trying to achieve from the exercise that you're having your client do? So always having a, you know, a rationale for everything that's on your program design template. So therefore, if a client says, well, why am I doing this? Or what is the purpose? You without hesitation can clearly say, well, you know what? We're doing this because when you moved in your, your assessment, I noticed this, this, and this, and this is going to help clean this up. So therefore you're going to move better, feel better and execute the exercises better, which will lead you to whatever goal they had. Exactly. And then that's the key thing. You and I both teach graduate school and, you know, we expect people to have that answer. So it's, it's the answer isn't, well, it's because leg day period, <laughs> like there should be tying it back to the assessment, tying it back to the phase of training, tying it back to the last progression or regret. Now I'm like spot on. That made a thousand percent sense. Not just because I saw it on Instagram last night. Right. You read it in a magazine. So if it's in a magazine or if it's on Facebook, it's got to be right, right? right you're, you're, you're dating yourself with a magazine. That's how we first started getting information, Wendy. Now it's Instagram. True. That very true. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that one. So if we look at, quote, rule two, we want to give them what they want while giving them what they need. So Marty, do you want to talk about controlling the narrative? Yeah. So the reason that this came in my head is rule number two is, People don't generally speaking, when I first get to know them and first start training them, they don't really care this whole method, right? They, they just want me to get them to what their goal was. So I have to build rapport. I have to, like I always say, there's the science of training, which I can teach to anybody if you put the time and effort in, even if you don't have a background in it. The art of training, that's the people skill of how do I learn to communicate it very simplicity, you know, in a very simplistic manner? How do I get them to understand the process? But how do I also work with, and when I say ego, we all have egos, meaning like what's important to them and how do we keep them engaged either short term before they fully understand the benefit of this program or long term because there is something that they just always like to do that's not dangerous, of course. So, you know, I will let them sometimes think that the program is something that they either did in the past or they had total control over. It. No, I'm guiding them through the model. And that's where as you become more familiar with the model and continuous education, you'll see how diverse this model truly is. We, and we, if you go back to 2020, I know a lot of people don't want to do that, but we had put out some great content in 2020. So go back to our content in 2020 and you'll see how creative we got with the model. So once you feel comfortable with that now, but at the same token, there's nothing wrong with having them have quote unquote some input. So if you look at our new template, we have, uh, you know, client's choice or, you know, an example would be like, if I said, Hey, Wendy, we got three minutes left. Give me one body part you want to work. And she said triceps. I'm not going to do an exercise where, you know, she's putting her arm over her head. She's, you know, crushing her kinetic chain checkpoints just because she said triceps. 
what I might do is a suspension training tricep where to me, it's just a moving plank with elbow extension flexion. She thinks she's getting her triceps and I'm like, great. I got more core stability. And if that was the right phase, or I might do a stability ball skull crusher and focus the whole time on keeping the spine neutral, engaging those glutes while she does her triceps. So again, I, we can play that game. I will say, no, that's not great for today's workout if they wanted something that totally would destroy the scientific approach I took. But you'd be surprised how many times when you're comfortable with the model, the phase of training, your client, whatever they throw you, there'll be a way to put it in and still make it make sense to your ultimate goal. And I think it's important to note when somebody is coming to you and even if it's one of the first few sessions and they're very hesitant with you being the stability person, you know, you're mm -hmm. using a ball and, you know, you're on one foot and you're having people do all these interesting, I shouldn't say, you know, interesting, different things that, that the typical person may do at the gym. You know, if you really dig deep into even phase two, I think that's really where this comes to life for me. Because oftentimes, especially if I have a, like a gentleman that comes in and they really love to do bench press, and again, it's Monday, so it's like National Chest Day, I'm not going to really take that away from them if that's what they want. Even though it's, it's, it's not unstable, it's, it's kind of against a phase one, what I'll mm -hmm. say is, great, if you want to do this, then I will let you do it, but you're going to have to do it for you know, eight to 12 repetitions, I'll give them a specific number, but I want it at a two zero two tempo. And I explain what that means. However, if we do something that you want to do, then you immediately have to do something that I want you to do. And they're like, right. okay, deal. And that's usually how you sell the model. And you can sell a client that may still be kind of on the fence about whether you guys are a good fit. So even though it's not a phase one and you know that there's a ton of compensations, that's a great way to kind of have it be a win-win in the beginning. And then they see how difficult that four to one tempo like push up is on the floor, which, you know, before they can do the military push ups for 50 as fast as they can. And they're not really going through full available range of motion, but that's how they were taught. Well, now I'm really focusing on the five kinetic chain checkpoints, a slower tempo, full protraction. Um, so adding quote the plus when they come up and the things that are fundamentally going to help them long term with the the um, some of the compensations I may have seen. So doing that chest press isn't going to hurt them. However, I'm still getting a win because I let them choose something they wanted to do. I just paired it as a superset, showed them how difficult it was. And then they started trusting me more and more to give them a little more stability work and a little less stuff that they used to do when they were playing football 30 years ago on, on a field. And I think the other thing too, is again, Wendy, you date us with um, the one comment. So I'm going to now just continue on with that. When <laughs> you and I first started this, people looked at us in gyms like we were nuts. Like we had to bring our own foam rollers and no one was standing on one leg. No one was doing planks. But now it's funny. I was talking to, to Mike Clark yesterday and the comment came up is like, it's easier to hide now as a trainer who knows this because everyone's trying to do some of it. No one has the system. But now when you walk into a facility, everyone, you see a ton of people trying to do foam rolling properly. Mobility has become more popular. So the good news is, over the last 5, 10, 15 years, because truly of what NESM and all of our amazing professionals out there, more and more people understand it now. So I think it's a little easier than when we were first trying to teach people like to get off the selectorized equipment and it's not just the beach body show, but there will be some people that still, you know, want what they want. So, uh, you know, the good news, we're aging ourselves, but I think it's gotten easier for fitness professionals to get people to focus on different type of training than maybe in the past. Yes. But that's then, why it's important to go back to the basics because sometimes people get carried away trying to be creative. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. And then that will then lead us to rule number three. So we go, this is the big one for me is you mm -hmm. have to have fun. Client trainer rapport is going to be what makes you successful. And we have said that multiple times and I will continue saying that to my grave because you literally your clients sometimes really become a lot of your family because you see them every week. Sometimes you see them multiple times a week. You get to know their family, you get to know their kids and you start to you know, go to events and do things and maybe even have a dinner. What's really important though is that you can have fun utilizing the model and don't make it boring. It shouldn't be boring. And if it's boring, then it's something in your programming 
I feel that you as a trainer may want to kind of think about your approach. So for example, if you have someone doing a single leg balance with reach and you have them take off their, their shoe, do it with them. And then they'll see how hard it was for the example that I gave you in the very beginning with that client that I, that literally has been working with the trainer for a while, but had had stopped doing some of the, the balance exercises. He was like, this is seriously. And we were like, just try it. And it was hard. And so I think it's your attitude, the way that you mm -hmm. kind of, you, you bring it out, um, you know, showing them the exercise. And if they're just like, they're really hesitant, it's like, you know what, just throw me a bone. Let's do one set. Let's see how you do. And if you do this, great, we'll do something different. However, I just want to make sure your body's prepared for some of the stuff we've got going on in the next couple, you know, exercises ahead. And usually you don't get any pushback, mm -hmm. but you have to be confident in the execution of the exercise when you're demoing it. You're showing them what, you know, hey, if you start to do this, this is what I want you to think of. Meaning if they're doing a single leg balance and they start to fall on their arch, I want you to focus here on the outside, get in this position and then do this. Show them, then get them in position, stand right next to them, put your hand on the outside of the knee, you know, kind of guide them. And usually you don't have a lot of pushback, but, you know, be that fun trainer, come in with a positive attitude, you know, how you approach that program is going to dictate how that one hour, 30 minute session, whatever it is that you're doing is going to go. And I think that's extremely, extremely important. Yeah. And, and two things that I can add because you, you covered it so well is, you know, from my experiences, when I was managing, you know, a team of trainers, the first thing I'd say is we are not allowed to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. We are not allowed to vent to our clients. And sometimes, you know, I think that when we get in that relationship, we got to be careful because we're there to, to energize and charge them up. However, there still has to be a plan of attack. Now we have to adjust that plan of attack every day because again, if they didn't sleep well, if they traveled, if they are high stress, like Wendy knows this, it's all good. Just saying, you know, my father was in a car accident last night, but if I had to go to a training session last night or this morning or whatever, that was going to be on my mind. That wouldn't have been the day to do a max strength workout, right? My focus and things weren't going to be there. So it's important, you know, to be engaged with your client, have fun. And a term that, you know, you'll hear a little bit more now in the fitness industry is that enter training, where entertainment is a huge component now with the different boutique studios, the different uh, formats. But the training component at the end of that should still be a scientific approach where what I don't want is exertainment, where it's exercise with entertainment. Because to me, training is a very rigid scientific approach for a desired outcome, could still be fun. Exercise <laughs> is just whatever happens, happens, right? So let's make sure that there's the training behind it, but make it entertaining, make it engaging, change it up, play games, have fun, music, whatever those things are, but let's not just lose the science behind it. That's the, you know the key point. Uh, yeah, you make a great point. And, and, and when I say that you're going to kind of become your friends and family, mm -hmm. it's all about them. So like you said, Marty, I mean, you had, you had something that happened to you, but if you talk to every one of your clients about, oh my gosh, guess what happened to me today? Exactly. Then it's all about you. And it's really should be all about them. Focus is always about them. And Sylvester, you asked a great point and I'm glad that I answered uh, some of it, but for those of you guys that can't see it, he was a asking basically, how do you deal with clients without explaining too much science? Um, to get uh, to them when you're doing stability exercises, if they start to quote, become too boring. And I mean, I think we, we, we really did discuss that. The, the big key point here is don't get into the science. Mm -hmm. Talk about the assessment, like, hey, I noticed that this is what happened. So we're going to do this exercise to see if we can cue, at, cue you out of that and build strength. So therefore we can work on more advanced exercises or however you want to approach it. Leave the science out of it because they don't care. They're paying you for you to fix, you know, this is my goal. Get me to my goal. And, and, but that's kind of take another step backward of, of why it's important to have progressions and regressions and a rationale for your exercise selection. And it should definitely be a win-win. Absolutely. And then if you think the science is important, touch on one point of it, like just, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're working with them all the time, you'll just continue to have a, a point here, a point there, a point here, you know, tie and tie the science to what makes the most sense back to their biggest movement compensation or their biggest goal. And, you know, like some of the things I would do is someone would say, well, I want to run a 5K. Well, if they don't want to do their balance, I'd be like, okay, let me get your foot in the right position to dip the pelvis in the right position, see how your knee's in line. And they're, you know, they're like, yeah, but like, okay, now imagine if we weren't doing that and you tried to run, your knee caved in. 
you know, so you can just sprinkle it in, but don't just <laughs> unload on them about, and I've seen some trainers do that because they're so enthusiastic about, cause we like to talk about this stuff, right? But you'll find some, some clients, they'll ask more, but mm -hmm. just, you know, tease them with it, give them a little bit here and there, and then see how that person responds to that information. I've had people tell me before, Marty, I totally get that, you know, just train me. And then I'm like, cool. They don't ever want to know. But I have some of those people, and that's kind of what I did in my doctor studies, how people perceive it. You be there are people on occasion that do want to know more, but it's bits and pieces. And I think it's important to mention your clientele because to your yeah. point, Marty, you know, when you're working, like for instance, some of my clients have been, you know, dealing with multiple athletic trainers and different trainers, and you know, they're at a they're at a high level in their career, and they may ask you one one question which is why, why, yeah. why? And if you can just spitball the answer immediately, well, because we're going to work on this, this, and this, and, you know, other than because I said so, or because it's in your program or because this is what I want you to do, you know, having a clear understanding. And, and I think teaching your client the whys is also great because I do have a lot of clients that really do want to know why they don't care mm -hmm. that it's called this particular muscle, like your sternocleidomastoid and, and, it, and it, you know, it's like behind your ear and on your clavicle and here, they don't, they don't care about that, mm -hmm. but you can say, you know, this big hunker muscle, it's really bringing your head forward. We really need to loosen that up by strengthening the back of the muscles in the neck. And that's going to help decrease some of the headaches and actually get you in better alignment. So let's try it. Yep. Something super simple. You don't have to go into the the science of origin insertion, what it does in all three planes. However, being able to clearly state why you're doing something, I think, is important. So just know your whys. Yeah, and you know, Andy, <laughs> at some point this year, we'll throw in kind of that maybe with what I did for my doctoral research because those three personality types, that is one of them. Is mm -hmm. if they know why, they're in. You now you've got a client for life if you can show that connection. So we'll come back to that. So, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so this is funny. I spoke about this today to this gentleman that's in the gym because again, Sylvester, this might be part of what you're asking. How do you keep it very simple? This is what I told him. I said, we're because he said something about a muscle. I said, we're not training muscles. We're training movements and boom, it just made sense to him all of a sudden. And one of the quotes that, you know, Prentice would be very happy because we both have a more <laughs> background, but it is so true. It's, you know, you can read it here, but it's the person that practices the same thing over and over and over again, who eventually will be a master in that. Now, that doesn't mean we want you to do the same exercise all the time. The principle of it is those fundamental movement patterns and being able to control those fundamental movement patterns in all three planes of motion. That is far more important than some of the other things that people put into their fitness programming that we want you just to be a master of the basic fundamental movement patterns. And then the progressions are very easy from there. And who doesn't love Bruce Lee? I mean, exactly. come on. <laughs> and to piggyback off what you just said, you know, like let's say you're doing a hinge pattern and you know, you're doing it just with no weight. It'd be a different, you know, it's, you're still still utilizing that same movement pattern. If you had a dumbbell versus a cable or you're, you know, and, or standing on different modalities. You're still focusing on the hinge pattern. You're still focusing on that particular movement. You're still trying to activate specific muscles in order to maintain that proper movement pattern, but switch it up. So it doesn't have to be the same thing, but to, to the, to the quotes point and Marty's point, you know, if you can master, you know, the set, and we're going to talk about the different specific movement patterns that you really want to make sure that you're, you're good at yourself as well as with your clients then you're going to be able to be so creative because there are fundamental movement patterns that have to be mastered before you start to integrate some of these other fun concepts or even more multi-joint exercises throughout. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we'll try to bring Bruce Lee in every so often. So I <laughs> kind of missed his opportunity for movie quotes, et cetera, et cetera. So, oh, well, he'll watch this and then he'll text us. So going back again to the basics is there's, hundreds of thousands of exercises, right? And, you know, but when you take it back to the simplest level, the 40,000 foot view, when you look, we have seven fundamental movement patterns. That's it. All the exercises that you're going to come up with are variations of these or combinations of these with different implements, different bases of support, different planes of motion, and at different speeds, right? Stability, strength, or power. 
So we got the squat, triple flexion, triple extension, the hinge we talked about, rotation or a twist, push, pull, lunge, and then gate locomotion where you're moving. So those are the seven that you have to fundamentally dial in with your five kinetic chain checkpoints in order, neutral spine, all of those, you know, foot and ankle, neutral, feet straight ahead, all those things. So when you go into a gym to either train yourself or create programs for clients, this is really what you're working with. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to do bicep. But like, well, what's the fundamental movement pattern you're going after? What plane of motion are you going after? What phase of training are you in? And then they're like, what? So I always started the 40,000 foot view. And a lot of people get lost in the these cool little exercises and don't even couldn't even correlate it back necessarily at first to those seven fundamental movement patterns. And those movement patterns, I feel, are extremely important in activities of daily living as well, mm -hmm. because you have to be able to get up out of a chair. You rotate to get out of a car. You know, if you go to pick something up, you've got to be able to, to hinge or twist or move or squat. So, and, and when it talks about gait or locomotion, you know, you want to have really good range of motion in your big toe. You know, your big toe is your push off. And, you know, why is that important? Well, you walk, you know, I mean, hopefully. Um, you know, there are some, uh, some exceptions based on, on some people that don't have that ability. However, a majority of us are able to walk and then we want to run and we be, uh, we have to be able to be quick and switch directions and, and move to your point in all three planes of motion. Right. So if you can dial these in and really, really make sure that, you know, even in the pushing and pulling, you, you know, oftentimes we only stop, we stop on a, let's say a chest press at 90 degrees. And so when you're bringing your elbows down and you stop at 90 degrees and then you push it up, well, if the, if the weight is extremely heavy and you're working on, you know, max loads and max lifts for one rep max, you're not going to be able to go down very far. However, we want to work through full available range of motion without compensation because if I go to slam open a door or I go to push something, I don't say 90 degrees and push. I actually swing my arm back and push. So it really does correlate to the activities that you do every day to movement patterns that you do every day. And remember in the gym, you get what you train for. So good information in proper range of motion, full available range of motion without compensation should truly be the thing that goes through your head when you're programming and working with every client in the gym in order to fully properly execute the program, the way that it's meant to be executed. And you're going to have so much better results yep. long-term. And the craziness is how powerful this model is. The gentleman that I'm referring to today, when I first met him, he saw me doing some unique shoulder, three planes of motion, PNF pattern. So he thought I was injured. I'm like, no, I do this so I don't get injured. <laughs> so originally, he was talking to me about shoulder pain and his head was forward. He would do dips and he would do dips. I know, Wendy, dips. I, I'm speechless. <laughs> but, well, he wasn't my client, but... I've got him to become one of the never dippers again. So I'm, I'm winning the war and he was doing upright rows and all those things. And again, these, sometimes they can be done, but long story short, all I did was get him to understand posture, get him to do a plank properly where he wasn't internally rotated. And all of a sudden these simple little things made his shoulder discomfort go away. Now I'm not trying to say I was here to treat pain, but it shows you that all, if you really can go back to these seven fundamental movement patterns and some basics, it's shocking how quickly the body can respond and then removing some of the things like the do no harm. Mm -hmm. it, all, it really does all correlate together. So, you know, however you design your program, your assessments should be the primary. Sorry, I'm trying to move from the sun here. The, uh, the assessments should really, you know, and I, I've said this multiple times, your assessments dictate your programming. And, you know, I, I really do fully, fully believe in the in the proper movement patterns. If you don't have those and you're really going to struggle throughout, you know, any type of exercise that you do with some of your clients. Absolutely. So quality versus quantity. We've been talking about this pretty much the entire webinar, but it's yeah. really important to. I mean, look at these images. And uh, Marty, this is a big one. The eyes see the weight. The muscles don't. So do you yeah. want to go so into that? This is, this is that ego check where <laughs> In a new client, I'm gonna pick on all men, guys. This is us. Well, I used to bench this, I used to do this. I used to, well, did you or did you not? And what I mean by that is, did you compensate your way through it? And did you use a whole bunch of other muscles and joints to do it? And were you using momentum? So, yes, you know, your eyeball sees 80 pound dumbbells. Pick pick the exercise, pick the weight. So yes, when we break it back down to some of the basics and put into the fundamentals and then go to the right tempos, sure, 
the weight might go from 80 to 50. But do you think your muscle knows that? No, your muscle knows, oh my goodness, there's more time under tension. There's more fatigue happening. There's more whatever, which means there's going to be more change within the muscle at a cellular level. And isn't that what we're training for? So that's where we got to check the ego is a lot of people think they're regressing. And it's like, no, you were you now again, be careful how you say this, but you guys get the point. You were never doing that anyways. You weren't doing it the way I want you to do it. You weren't executing it and putting that quality strain on your body or stress the right way. You were finding other ways to do it. So you were never really that good at it anyways. Don't say it that way. I'm just <laughs> doing here. So I just need to be blunt. So that's what I'm saying is don't let our ego get in the way to going back to the fundamentals and doing it the right way just because we think that we've gotten weaker. Your body thinks that you're actually getting stronger because of that new stimulus. And you're recruiting more muscles when you have proper form. And so remember, you've got your prime movers, which is whatever it is. Say we're going to use your chest. You're trying to activate your pecs for sure. But you're also going to get anterior delt. You're going to end up when you're fully extended. Triceps are going to be involved. There are multiple muscles that are going to be involved to help move your, your body into that particular position. So if you have full available uh, range of motion, you're doing proper movement patterns. So, you, you know, you, it's very, and you're slowing things down. So you're actually taking the time to get these muscles engaged. When you go from phase one to phase two, and then you end up going into muscle development or hypertrophy to try to gain more size, you're going to have more muscle recruitment. So therefore, you are going to have more muscles involved, and you will start to see what you're hoping to see long term. You have poor movement quality, and then you start to do some of these exercises. That's when, you know, for example, if you have a hinge joint and you're trying to do, you know, your let's say, take your knee, for example, if things aren't lined up properly, people start to feel knee, knee pain. However, you're trying to you know, do leg extensions with an extremely heavy amount of weight and your knee starts to hurt, then that's telling you that your body isn't ready. And, and so very, very important to make sure you've got proper alignment throughout. So therefore, when you do get to these other um, phases where you really want to lift the heaviest that you can lift, it's amazing how you were stuck at like lifting 80 pound dumbbells on a chest press. You took two steps back, spent some time in phase one, phase two, and now you try it again. And 80 is easy to knock out reps where you can easily go to 100 pounds and they're like, wait, what, did, what just happened here? And it's like, you didn't do anything different other than now you've got all the muscles firing the way that they were supposed to fire. You've got better alignment and you're going to have more muscle recruitment to lift a heavier load. Yep. And Melanie here makes a great point about, you know, training ourselves. So I always say, and I know other people say it, we're our first client. So, and Wendy, you mentioned it earlier about being able to at least do some of the repetitions. Now we both trained elite athletes. We've been blessed that way. I'm not going to do it as fast as they're going to do it. I'm not going to do it as powerful. That's not the point. The point is that I can visually demonstrate the majority of things that I, uh, I'm expecting them to do. Sometimes we get it. Sometimes we're dealing with injuries. But, so we're not asking you to do it to that level. But can you give the person the visual? And it should the answer should be yes, because we should be training ourselves as the athletes we are through this model anyways. And if you look at the, the picture of the poor gentleman on the bottom right, um, it's, this is sad, but unfortunately we see this at the gym. Like, look how much I'm lifting and everyone's staring like in awe of the fact that this guy is doing a squat with that amount of load on the back. But think about all that we've talked about, the importance of the five kinetic chain checkpoints. Look at his feet in relation to his knees. Think about what's happening at the knee joint. He's got a shift to the right. So think about what's happening at the hip complex. So you know that his core isn't really dialed in. He's looking up that puts him into an anterior pelvic tilt, which we talked about, which again can cause low back pain, but he's doing it. So is this something that you want to praise because he was able to do this squat with this load? In my opinion, no, because it wasn't executed correctly. So it's very, very important to say just because you do it doesn't mean you should. And, so and the, the funny thing about that picture, Wendy, and I swear I saw this, but I didn't pick it up when you sent this over, is when you look at the two pictures, I'm more impressed with the gentleman at the top. <laughs> Me too. Because he's probably close to 50. But look at the smile on his face compared to the person's face below. Now, I get when you are doing a heavy load, of course, you're not going to be smiling. But he looks comfortable in that position, right? So I'm more impressed with that than I would be with this younger gentleman, even, you know, moving that way. So, again, it's about how well do you move something, not how far do you move something. Yes. 
and we want to make sure we're getting the right muscles to fire. I really do not believe that that individual is probably firing the muscles the way that they were intended to fire in order to execute that exercise properly. <laughs> So um, easy isn't always easy. So this is super important. This is something that I hit on in the first two minutes of our, our webinar is you have to understand that exercises that sometimes look easy when done correctly, when uh, you know the acute variables are taken into consideration and proper movement patterns are executed, there it's not always easy. And I, we see this, Marty and I have taught so many live workshops and we love it because we get to meet so many new trainers and faces. And there's people that have been in the industry for a really long time. And there's people that just passed their CPT certification that we're excited to meet that just joined the NASM family. When we put them through a phase one exercise and we're doing this in our workshop, we are using nothing besides body weight because we don't travel with a bunch of stuff. And by the time we just do a very basic, usually just one set of some of these exercises while we're cueing and while we're saying, squeeze this, do this, look at this. And we're telling you guys how to correct some of your movement patterns. People finish and they're like, oh my gosh, that was so hard. And it's like, okay, you did a single leg balance with reach. You did this, that, and the other, which seem like they should be easy, but when put together with right programming and and, a, and it, it is based off of assessments oftentimes of how we decide what exercises we're gonna do in the workshop because we see the common compensations, you have to have a really good foundation before you can start loading your body in order to lift more long-term and then become more powerful. So we use the model and it is a stair step for a reason. You're only as strong as you are stable and you're only as stable or um, you're only as strong or only as powerful as you are strong. Yep. But if you don't have any, any foundation, you're never going to be as powerful as you possibly could be. If you just skip through it and say, okay, I'm going to go from strength into power because something is going to break down and you have a very high chance of increasing injury. And you know, the ironic thing is tomorrow I have uh, my lower body day and I have to do like single leg squats, single leg remaining deadlifts, and my foot and ankle is my Achilles heel, no pun intended. And I would so much rather go do a heavy leg press. I would so much rather go do any any other of what people would think are the harder progressions. You know, it's the foundation. It doesn't mean it's the easiest. It's but like I'm like, oh man, stabilization for foot and ankle tomorrow. Like you know, that's to me is like the hardest program to do compared to some of these others. So again, it's it because it takes so much uh, mental strength to make sure my form and technique is good. I have to do those 12 to 20 reps and it's not what I'm great at. So think about me tomorrow morning around 630 a.m. time and hopefully I'm dialed in. But, you know, everything else to me would be easier. Leg extensions, leg presses, leg curls. That's not is hard as controlling those little muscles and making sure my kinetic chain all the way up is not compensating while I'm trying to do the appropriate type of exercise. So yay tomorrow morning. <laughs> Definitely easier when you think about it, just hopping on a machine and you really don't have to think about it other than just moving whatever limb it is that you're trying mm -hmm. to focus on. But think about correlation back to activities of daily living. You get what you train for. So you might as well move the way that, you know, you were intended to move and therefore you can execute more. You're going to burn more calories. You're going to get th more things involved and you're going to have long-term, you're going to have a healthier life, Marty, than just sitting on well, a machine. And again, it goes, it goes back to what I might be working on. Somebody else who's brand new to it might not accomplish. So it's, it's what's appropriate for me, but it, because I progress myself, it's like, Oh, this never gets easier in the right way. So, you know, you're always progressing and always moving, but I always think phase one is the one program where I'm like, Oh, mentally get myself ready. Oh, me too. Phase one and phase two to me are definitely the hardest. And people are like, well, why? And I'm like, well, you realize how, how hard body weight is. And then yeah. you're thinking, man, maybe I should lose a few LBs when you're <laughs> trying to do some of this stuff. Or that's how I feel. Because I'm like, man, this is super, super difficult. Yeah. But, you know, getting everything to fire the way that it was intended to fire, it really does pay off long term. It's just you have to be patient and understand it's not always easy. It may look easy. And if you do it over and over again and you can execute it with precision and you make it look easier, then you need to progress that to make it go harder. And then have someone else challenge someone else. Make it fun. Challenge your clients. Do it with your clients. Get down. Do a set with them. If they're complaining, like, why am I going to do this? I'm like, all right, let's just do it together. I'll gut it out with you. And But you better make sure you can do it. 
and and do it well because you are their guide. You are the person that they're trusting and they're putting their 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 I don't want to say their life in your hands, but they kind of are for an hour because you are going to write a program that hopefully is going to change them for the better. Gotcha. So why don't we do our key takeaways? And I see a question Katie asked me, but what we'll do is we'll do our key takeaways and it looks like we have some time for our questions. Sure. Um, back to the basics. I think that is, I mean, that's the name of this webinar and Marty and I cannot, you know, we can't stress the importance of really, really being able to have the fundamental movement patterns, being able to execute them well. Think Bruce Lee every time, every single time in your head, like you want to be the master of this movement, then you've got to be able to execute it and execute it in different ways. So therefore you're challenging your body always. However, form is always going to you know tell you whether you're doing it you know correctly or not so just don't say that you're going to do 12 and if you notice at 10 things are not moving the way that they were intended to move you need to regress it and it's a self check if you're if you're doing it for yourself and you also need to think how can i regress this with my client without making him feel like he was not successful so finding your your voice on how you're going to discuss this with your client or start them in the most regressed way possible. And then therefore you don't ever get yourself in that situation. Absolutely. And you know, tomorrow morning when I go in, I'm going to, that's how my mindset is like, okay, what, what am I trying to focus on today? What movement patterns, what do I need to do to execute those? What, how do I feel this morning? Like, right. Did the coffee kick in and am I firing on all cylinders or do I need to do different progressions to warm up, to get to where I need to be? Because again, if it's not done perfect, I'm moving myself away from it. And then, you know, as we go through the other ones, these have been so standard for us throughout all this. Don't overthink the model. Let the model be your best friend. We're always going to reassess. Obviously, we have to adjust goals as needed because life gets in the way. People progress quicker. People don't progress as quickly. Not, you know, pretty simple. And then as you spend more and more time with the model, you're not really repeating the knowledge. You're starting to find all those hidden gems in the model. And then the creativity can come. And then, of course, we have to have fun. Yes. Take some of the exercises that look easy, spend some time on them because remember they're not. And I know there was a question that had come up. I had seen it on the chat. I'm going to just stress this again. It is our third point, but how often, I think the question was like, how often should you, uh, you know, before you can move into a different phase, remember yeah. the, uh, the assessment is going to truly dictate when they're ready to progress. So on average, it takes the body, you know, four to six weeks to, build that specific adaptation. And remember when we're talking about phase one, we're looking for stabilization endurance. So mm -hmm. that will really help focus on cleaning up the compensations that you saw from the start in their assessment. And then when you reassess, and again, it'll depend on your client, but if you reassess them, you know, four or five weeks later, and most of those compensations have cleaned up, not everything has to be perfect, but if it looks way better, then you are successfully kind of quote cleared to move into phase two. And uh, you'll spend the four to six weeks doing the supersets. So now we're looking for more strength endurance. So you're working on supersets, you're working on specific protocols, maybe undulating between phase one and phase two. And then after that, four to six weeks, you can look into possibly moving them up the model. Just don't move them up because you think they're going to get bored. If they're getting mm -hmm. bored, that means you need to think about the neural continuum, which Marty and I have talked about multiple times in, in previous webinars. So go back and visit the neural continuum webinar, talking about how you can take one exercise and do it you know, so many different ways with different demands on the body. Uh, just be creative. And, and that that's what ended up leading us down to the be creative and have fun. Just mm -hmm. just know it takes the body a certain amount of time in order to build that that stabilization system that you really need in order to build the strength. Yep, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And I see a question here from Katie asking, how do uh, I program for stability mobility type days? And are they on deloading days during a strength cycle? I spend every day doing mobility and stability. <laughs> Every I've day. Said, I've always <laughs> said I've never met someone that's too stable. You can fill in the back part of that sentence at, at the end of that. But stability is so important. You know, so naturally I maybe I wasn't gifted in having great mobility in certain joints. So I have to continually work on it. I've of course improved, but I always want to strive for that perfection. So what I tend to do, what works for me is when I'm not traveling the first 30 minutes of my morning, once I get up and get moving, Wendy knows, cause she'll text, like she used to text, are you up? I'm like, really? Seriously? You know, <laughs> so from five 30 to six, I'm doing mobility works and some stability. 
regardless of what my workout looks like, because I just want to get my body moving in the day. Then when I go through my training, I'm, you know, depending what phase of training I'm in, I still go back into the gym, maybe an hour or two later, and I still start again with some, I may not foam roll, depending on how quick the gap was, but back into some mobility and stability work before I do any phase of training. So I use a corrective exercise warm up as a targeted warm up for all phases. Now, if I'm in stability, I'll go right into that. But if I'm into strength, I'm going to go through the continuum. I'll do some stability work, then maybe, you know, whatever that is, and then some active stretching, and then I'll get into the program. If I'm doing power, I'll do stability. I'll do go from static active to dynamic. So I just blend right in wherever the road is supposed to veer off, but I will do stability and mobility every day. Um, I rarely take a full day off of activity. I don't exercise every day, but I'll always do postural things at the end of the day. I'll, you know, go through a routine. It's just like, you know, to me, it's like flossing your teeth. It's something that you know you need to do at least once a day, brush your teeth. So I put some stability mobility in and it keeps my body feeling the best. Maybe if I didn't need it, I wouldn't do it quite so often. But the days that I don't, I feel, you know, I feel a little stiff and I just, I don't enjoy that. So it's just something that I probably do constantly. <laughs> that was a great question. Good, good question, Katie. So Sylvester has a question. Um, it's a question actually, Marty, for, for us both. You know, what's your favorite stability exercise that you mm -hmm. do on a daily basis? And I have I have my three. And two of them mm -hmm. are, are my stability exercise and one is a dynamic exercise or dynamic warm up, if you will. With every single client and every phase of training, I always always have someone do bridges and they may do them on the ball. They may do them with the weight. We may do them with the bar. It depends on what phase of training we're in. However, I want to fully make sure after we've done the foam rolling and whatever stretches we need to do that those glutes are activated. So therefore when they're doing some kind of execution, we know the glutes need to be involved. I know that they're ready to go. That's my personal preference. That's probably my all time favorite. Uh, the second one that I like to do uh, is some sort of plank. I do planks on the ball, planks on the floor, side planks, you know, uh, planks into rotation. I do a lot of different ones just because I want to make sure that my core is really dialed in. Those little muscles that protect the vertebrae are dialed in. I've got my abs in, my glutes squeezed. So that to me is a really good one. Plus, I really focus on trying. I'm a winger, so like meaning my shoulder blades wing up probably because I'm sitting in front of a computer a lot or I'm doing a lot of hands-on work. So I really try to work on my um, my uh, serratus anterior and that really helps through that. Um, those are probably my go-to on a stability exercise. The one thing that I also include and I have every client do as well is after we've gone through, we've done those two exercises, then I'll usually have them do some sort of lateral tube walk. And that's just to make sure I can get the glute med firing correctly because again, I want the abductors and, you know, making sure that they're dialed and ready to go. So those are definitely my three go-to. You know, mine would be very similar because it's the same movement patterns, right? So mm -hmm. going back to what we taught today, Wendy named the exercises, but she's really going after movement patterns. So I do the same type of uh, concept with those exercises. It just depends on the day and what equipment I may or may not have around, but truly I probably spend a little more time on the mobility work. Uh, you know, I'm all, I need to foam roll a full, you know, 15 minutes and I need to do at least 15 to 20 minutes of static stretching every single day. Uh, the only time that changes is if I'm in some unique traveling situation and I just can't have the environment to do it. So from there, then the exercises will fall into some glute activation, core stabilization and post postural reset, I'll call it. And there's a ton of different ways I do that, but that's a, a standard for me, but I probably spend a little more time on the foam rolling and the st and uh, static stretching before I get into that. Perfect. I think we have time for one more. And I, I saw one earlier. Um, I'm hoping our producer Greg can find it. Um, if not, Marty and I can try to go back and answer the question in the chat at a later time. So um, what do you do if your client is in a bad state of mind when he or she arrives to train? Oh, good question. It can have two different outputs in the case to do sport she he will change his sense of humor meanwhile in the exercise or based on stress it causes an injury um okay so basically marty how do you change yeah. someone's <laughs> someone's mindset right. when they come into the gym so mindset's everything but the first thing to me is if they got there that's a win because the mindset can't be that bad that they didn't show up right because most people if your mindset's that bad they may call and cancel so 
you know, again, if I would have called them canceled yesterday, you know, I wouldn't want someone to grind me because they may or may not tell you the why. So, you know, you got to get to know your client and know how far you can push and ask for the why. But let's say they got there. You just, you know, you got your strengths and how you handle your personality. You know, the key thing is always being kind, never being sarcastic. And definitely, uh, I always say we want to use positive reinforcement, not negative, because you just never know. But what I do is I let the exercise change their attitude. We know physiologically what happens to people when they start to exercise. It's the best medicine, right? Like, I know this is a, not fully down this line, but you know, I've read the quote before, like not exercising is like taking a depressant. So if you get them exercising and moving, their personality is probably going to change. So, you know, I think that at, at a high level, I hope that helps answer the question. I just do my best to deal with the personality they're giving me at the time, get them moving and hopefully let the endorphins kick in. And then whew, everyone feels better. Cause I know I've been bad moods before. And as soon as I start exercising, I'm like, oh, that was the best thing I could have ever done. And unfortunately, I think for us too, as, as personal trainers, it's our, our job to kind of change their mindset. So if they come in, they're having a bad day. It's like, okay, why are you having such a bad day? Right. And they'll say, oh, this happened. Or, you know, you know, someone hit my car and, you know, oh, and they're just, they're sour, which they should be. That is a very unfortunate event. However, it's like, okay, you know what? We can't change it for this hour. Let's just get it done. You know, let's take all the aggression out on the exercises. Let's make sure you have good form. Let's have a good time. And you know what? You can deal with that when we're done. And it's amazing how something that quickly by showing that you care, you know, saying, let's just put it into the workout. Let's put it all there. Um, it really does make a big difference. And then they leave happier. And then the thing that was so stressful and so hard to deal with in the very beginning then seems a little less less of a big deal when they're leaving. Absolutely. Well, Marty, this was fun. See, and you were like, do we have enough in here? I'm like, Wendy, the, well, <laughs> really well like, you and I can talk all day. So, <laughs> the point. And this is such to me, even though it's the basics, there's, this is such a great topic in the fundamentals. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I enjoyed it as always. So hopefully everybody else did. But if you want to give us uh, out our contact information or if the, Greg wants to put it up here, so I, he went to me first. So you guys can see mine here, Instagram at DR. <laughs> well, I was waiting for you. I expected you to be first. You know, I'm a gentleman. So <laughs> Instagram here is dr.martymiller72 and then email marty.miller at nesm.org. And before, Wendy, I pass that off to you. Once again, I forgot to introduce our producer, Greg. I don't know why that's, you know. So we have a wonderful producer who makes us look really, really good, or at least me. So thank you, Greg. <laughs> Always. Thank you, Greg. And if you guys want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13, or you can email me directly at wendy.bats at nasm.org. And Wendy, where else can they find you? What do you do? Come on. What's that other big? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. I'm also doing a podcast with Mr. Ken Miller. If you guys are interested, you can find us uh, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. We have one called Random Fit, and we talk about a bunch of random fitness topics. So it's super fun. And we would love to have you guys listen in and tell us what you think. And then also to get out and, and interact with all of you, I do two coffee talks tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. East Coast time, Instagram live, and then Tuesdays, 930. I'm just there hanging out, waiting for you guys to fire off questions. So we're always trying to get content and information and to hear what you guys want us to continue to bring to you. So Wendy, thanks so much. And everyone that logged in today, thank you for carving out some time. And as I said, Greg, you're the best producer in the world. Appreciate it. So we can't wait to see you guys soon. And we've got a very cool series coming up. I don't know how much we want to tease it, but let's call it one of those love, hate uh, exercises. We're going to really break it down over a couple of weeks and make sure that you have the best science behind a very common exercise that's used in fitness. So I'll leave it at that. You're gonna have to come.